coordinator for the Ohio Structured Transportation Education and Training Program, also known as OSTEP, and that is uh, operating through the Local Technology Assistance Program, also known as LTAP. Now, how's that for a title? My business cards are about that long when I spell everything out. My job as coordinator has been to develop the short course on pavement preservation and others that I'm working on, and now to conduct that program for you folks. Exactly one week ago, right about now, your thoughts and concerns were probably on your job responsibilities, maybe even pavement preservation or other infrastructure work. In an instant, all of us were jolted into thoughts and concerns about infrastructure on a much larger scale and life itself. Since that time exactly one week ago, it's been difficult, if not impossible, for us to keep our minds on infrastructure. At least it has me, and I suspect it has you. To keep our minds on infrastructure in our Ohio communities and our counties. Now it's time for us to struggle back to those local job-related thoughts. And before we do, let's take a moment of silent reflection for those persons whose lives were ended by the terrorists and also for those persons who grieve over losses of family members and friends. Just yesterday I was here at a luncheon and learned about uh, a brother of a local engineer, Ed Ferris, lost his brother in the, in the tower. And uh, you, some of you may know Ed. He works uh, as a consultant and uh, been a longtime friend. So please, let's uh, just have a moment of silence, please. Thank you. To begin our program, I want to call your attention to the agenda in your folder titled OSTEP Short Course Pavement Preservation. That agenda expands greatly on the one that was part of the registration form sent to your office some months ago. You can imagine when we prepare those flyers and those announcements, so we do it months before we have things really arranged, so we have to tweak the agenda quite a little bit sometimes to fit the speakers that we're able to bring in. On that form, some information to help you to contact presenters after tomorrow. Now, some of the presenters are going to be here for both days, both today and tomorrow. And uh, Others will, will not be, so you'll need to catch them as you can. And you can catch them later with the use of this agenda. My introduction of uh, our 14 presenters is going to be very brief, and they will touch more on their credentials and experience during their presentations. The objective of this short course was stated as follows. As funds diminish for construction and reconstruction of roads and highways, preservation of existing facilities becomes increasingly important. Old ways of band-aiding or ignoring pavement distress can no longer be tolerated or afforded. This short course will present various approved methods for getting longer life from pavements and more mileage from your funds. We believe that if you'll play, pay close attention to the messages to be brought to you today and tomorrow, it will serve to enable your time in this course to gain that stated objective. Now before we start, there are several housekeeping items we need to talk about. One is, you may have already noticed that this presentation is being videoed. And that is for the purposes of our organization. We're, uh, we have a contract with the Federal Highway Administration to do some videos, one on pavement preservation. So part of this course will be used, we believe, in that video that we will be uh, furnishing for FHWA to use around the country. 
So don't be uh, concerned about the video. Please be, feel free to ask questions during the presentations. I'm going to take the liberty of saying that our, our presenters will welcome your questions as we go along. We have a tight schedule, and they're closely scheduled. In fact, they're closely scheduled. The first thing I'm going to do is change the order of the first two speakers. Uh, Mr. McQuiston of the Federal Highway Administration had to return to his office. We tried to get him to change shirts. He has a Penn State shirt on this morning. And uh, we told him we'd let him back in if he changed shirts. I'm not sure we're going to pull that off. After all, he is with the Federal Highway Administration. Eric Morris, Assistant Administrator of Pavements, the second presenter on your agenda, has agreed to step forward and, and be number one. Eric said he didn't mind being number one at anything. So we're going to put him ahead of the Federal Highway Administration this morning in just a couple minutes. Want to uh, mention a couple things uh, besides the videoing. Uh, the brakes don't show on here unless you do some calculating and don't worry about the brakes. They'll come when, when they come. You will get brakes. I want you to feel free to move around. I want you to feel free to ask questions. I want you to feel free to do everything except uh, disturb the rest of the class. So if you do leave, one thing we ask is that you don't all leave at once. And the second thing is that you do come back. Uh, that's very important because it looks bad on the video if there's nobody here but uh, the, the presenters. Also, I think you found out that the restrooms are across the hall. Uh, refreshments are right outside there, and you can help yourself to them anytime. And uh, we will be having lunch next door here. Uh, I've already heard uh, Tate and Sarah out at the table warn people not to fill up on the refreshments because there's an awfully good lunch ahead for you. With that, are there any questions about the agenda or the program for today? If not, then I'm going to present Eric Morris, Assistant Administrator of Payments. Eric, if you'll come forward and take over here. Good morning, everybody. Um, without the introduction of Bob's, I just want to give you some idea of preventive maintenance. Um, most of you, I assume, have heard about preventive maintenance, and you may hopefully understand that preventive maintenance is not reactive maintenance, it's not really routine maintenance. It's maintenance on a roadway similar to an oil change on a car. Doing things to the pavement early on in its life to hopefully get more life out of what, what you've already got, that, that investment that you have. And the key to it is knowing what's really wrong with the pavement, knowing when the right time is to, to apply pre a preventive maintenance technique, and, and knowing which preventive maintenance technique to apply. And my presentation is going to try to give you some insight into that. Uh, it's certainly not going to answer all your questions. I, I, doesn't, I, I don't have all the answers. But I will try to give you some idea of pavement condition uh, and project selection. What we're going to talk about is both rigid and flexible pavements. Uh, we're going to look at the observable, observable distress, uh, the cause of the distress, and what the available treatments are. Um, the, only, the only flaw to this presentation is that I don't consider the combination of distresses. To do that would be um, a pavement management system itself. Uh, there will be others that will speak about pavement management. But we'll look at individual distresses. When you, when you look at a pavement and you see a certain distress, it tells you something about what's wrong with the pavement or what's right with the pavement. So let's get going started with flexible, or I'm sorry, rigid pavements. Um, transverse cracking. Everybody 
can identify a transverse crack. It's a crack or a break at approximately right angles to the pavement center line. Um, it's very important that people understand rigid pavement cracking because not all cracks are bad cracks. Rigid pavements are going to crack. Everybody knows that. That's why we put a dowel bar and why we cut contraction joints because we know it's going to crack in those locations. If you have a reinforced concrete pavement, then we assume that in between those contraction joints, those, those, those saw cuts where we force a crack, we're going to get additional cracks. And those additional cracks are then held tightly together by the reinforcing steel, the mesh. The mesh doesn't take a load. It just holds the aggregate tight. If you've ever watched um, a concrete cylinder be compressed and break, well, when it breaks, the break almost always goes around the aggregates. It never goes through them. The paste is where the break is at. So when you have mesh in a pavement, it takes that crack that goes around those aggregates, holds those aggregates tightly together so that the aggregates can transfer the load across the crack. Now a plain concrete pavement is a completely different situation. A plain concrete pavement does not have any mesh between those contraction joints. If you get cracks in a plain concrete pavement and you have some amount of loading, it's just a matter of time between the time that that crack becomes a bad crack and starts causing you problems. So when you're looking at a pavement, it's very important to know what kind of pavement you have and what kind of a crack that is, whether or not it's a good crack or a bad crack. So what are the causes of cracking? Well, slab length. Slabs that are longer than 15 feet are definitely going to crack. Now the mesh is designed to uh, take care of the crack. Um, slab curl. Temperature gradients in the slab create a cantilever effect that cracks the slab with load. What that means is as uh, early in the morning on a hot summer month, the bottom of the pavement is much warmer than the top because the, the, the air has cooled the pavement off at the surface, but you've got a huge, tremendous heat sink down there that's been soaking up sun the day before all day. So what happens is the top is, is cooler and it's shorter than the bottom, which causes the pavement to, to stand up like this. And it's not very, it's not, you know, a tremendous amount. It's millions, mills or thousandths of an inch, but it's enough to create a void underneath that, that edge at those joints and then you get deflection there from the trucks and that will crack the pavement. So the shorter the slab length, the less cantilever that you have. And curing. As moisture cures, cures out of a slab, the volume decreases, which creates the need for contraction joints. Timing and placement of saw cuts is critical. That's a construction item. So there's a lot of things that's going to crack a concrete pavement. We know that they're going to crack. We design them to crack. The key is, um, are they cracking where they're intended to crack or not? Depending upon how much cracking you have, and this is an economic consideration, and, and, and the treatments are going to be that way for all this presentation. Everything's going to be based on economics. And you're going to have to do those economics. I can't do them for you. Um, but when you have transverse cracking, one of the obvious treatments that you can do is, is seal the cracks. By keeping the cracks sealed, uh, you're reducing the amount of moisture that's going to go down in there and rust that steel, that mesh. You're reducing the amount of incompressibles that'll get into that crack. Um, several things. Another thing you can be doing to bad cracks, cracks that need to be repaired, is a full depth rigid repair. Saw it out, drill in dowels and, and put in new concrete. Um, another possible treatment would be the dowel bar retrofit, where you go in and you grind slots in the pavement and place dowels. I'm quite certain that you're going to have presenters today that are going to go into those techniques in more detail. Pumping. Pumping is another distress in rigid pavements. Uh, it's the ejection of fine soil particles 
through cracks and joints or along the pavement edge. And you can see uh, in, the, in the, the photo here the, the uh, white stains that you have along the pavement edge. These are photos that are taken from our Delaware 23 research project that ODOT has going on where the, uh, the edge is, is literally deflecting uh, more than the shoulder because the load is out on the pavement and it's creating a pumping of fines up through that edge joint. Um, Pumping is a real problem. If you have cracks in a plain concrete pavement that are allowing this movement to go on, you will end up pumping subgrade fines up through, or sub-base fines up through the pavement. So something has to be done with pumping. <coughs> what causes pumping? Um, so lack of load transfer uh, across the two faces that are causing the pumping. Um, water is going to in, uh, exacerbate pumping. The fines have to be there and the loading have to be there. And basically what this, what this slide shows is as the vehicle travels across the pavement and there's water, moisture, and fines underneath that, that crack, and a lack of load transfer across that crack, the, the tire first pushes this down and then, re, and then as it travels across releases it, which brings it back up. And then at the same time it's pushing this one down, which is pushing all of the pressure in this direction. And some of, its po of, of, of the fines are being ejected out and some of them are building up right here. And that's why when you see faulting on a pavement, in the direction that you travel, the forward edge of the crack is always lower than the, the leave end of the crack. That's where the, the fines are going to be deposited. So what are the treatments? Well, the treatments here are the same thing as the crack. Depending upon the number of cracks that you have and, and, and uh, whether it's economical to go out and repair that pavement. Um, you, you can repair those cracks and end that pumping problem with full depth rigid repairs. Um, you can do dowel bar retrofits and then underseal if where the voids are, fill the voids with the undersealing. Or, or, and with both of those, you can go in and do concrete pavement grinding to smooth that pavement out. All of these can be considered to be preventive maintenance treatments for rigid pavements. Faulting is just the, the, the same thing. You have the crack, you have the pumping, you get the faulting. It's just a difference in elevation between the abutting slabs. The causes are very much the same as the pumping. Um, lack of load transfer induces the pumping. The pumping then will allow the faulting to take place. Again, you gotta have water, fines, and loading. And this, this really indicates the need for Good drainage in a pavement and possibly crack sealing some of these cracks uh, will slow down some of this. Again, faulting the same, the same number of treatments, the same exact treatments as we've had all along. Um, and again, the, the, I think the concrete industry is going to talk about all of these treatments later today or tomorrow. Joint spalling. A little bit different type of deterioration or distress, the breakup or disintegration of concrete at the joint. Um, you can see the spall here in the, in the photograph, right, right in there. There's little spalls right, right in there. And the causes of, of spalling, um, oh, here's, here's a little, another, another spall. Uh, this is a little bit more. Um, deterioration than the, the, the earlier one. Um, anybody, can anybody tell me what that picture is a classic example of? Anybody at all? No, one fellow said the curl. That, that looks to me as though we have a locked joint. The dowel bars were not placed during construction. Uh, perfectly in alignment and allowing that 
movement to take place, and it's just totally destroyed that, that joint. A lot of, a lot of causes for spalling. Um, dowel alignment, improper alignment during construction is going to cause spalls. Uh, a lack of a joint seal. Um, there is some, some uh, interest in this right now in, in a national perspective, whether or not sealing is, is really a, an important thing in concrete pavement. But nearly any book that you read that was published before 1995 would tell you that if you don't have joints sealed in a concrete pavement, they will fill with incompressibles. And those incompressibles will then create localized pressure. And it'll cause the spalling to occur. Um, there is some, some people now around the, the country that are saying maybe that might not be true. Uh, I think research is probably needed to prove any of that one way or the other. Um, what are the treatments for joint spalling? Well, you can certainly do uh, crack and joint sealing. That'll keep the incompressibles out of those cracks and joints and reduce the amount of spalling. So there's a preventive maintenance technique that, that you can take home with you when you see joints that are open and, and the seals are missing. Uh, you can go in with, with that, that first photo that I showed of a, um, a, a spall right there and go in and do a bonded patch. Um, where you would saw some of that area out and square it off and, and put in something to fix that. It doesn't look like it's a locked joint in a situation like that. It actually looks to me like maybe that is the cause of uh, the result of possibly some, some incompressibles, some localized incompressibles. And you can also do full depth patching in the case where you have uh, the misalignment of the dowels. That's all I have on rigid pavements. Those are the basic distresses that you're going to find on a rigid pavement, and, and those are the, the treatments. Flexible pavements, um, uh, raveling. Um, probably all of you are familiar with raveling, which is the disintegration of the pavement from the surface downward due to the loss of aggregate particles. Uh, this is what I would term a medium severity raveling, uh, where you can see the the, the pitting of the asphalt in the area right here, which is the center of the pavement, and there's some out here in the wheel track. Um, this is kind of classical raveling. You can, you can tell where the, where the tires are kneading the pavement uh, over time, especially on warm days, keeping the, the asphalt um, tight to the aggregate, and where it's not is in the center, and that's where your aggregates get dry, your, your, your mix gets a little drier quicker, and, and uh, you lose the aggregate quicker. And then here's a, uh, a high severity raveling where you're just really losing those aggregate particles uh, wholesale throughout that pavement surface. Um, what you do to a situation like this is you've got to understand the cause more. It, the cause of this is very important on how you, how you treat it. Um, the causes can be several, the density. If you don't have good compaction in construction, uh, you're going to have more air voids. And with more air voids, you're going to have more water getting infiltrated down into that, that layer. And when, when that happens, water and oil don't mix. So there's a lot of water laying in there, and it will break down the chemical bonds between the aggregate and the asphalt. And it will wear away that, that asphalt, and you will end up with those aggregates being loose and, and flying out. Uh, construction practices can lead to uh, raveling. Um, segregation during construction, which is you know, the way they handle the mix, uh, the way they, they, they release their, their wings on their paver, the way they bring their mix from their plant in trucks to the, to the paver. All of these things can segregate the large aggregates from the small aggregates, uh, creating a, um, a segregated mix where all of your, m much of your asphalt is with your smaller aggregates over in this area. And then you've got a few larger aggregates here that are not really um, 
compacted well with the smaller aggregates surrounding them and, and the goo, and then the larger aggregates will, will pop out. Your quality control um, of your mix operation. Uh, production control of the, the particles uh, finer than the number 200. Sieve, the dust. Um, you've got to control that. Too much dust is going to give you a dry mix, and that's going to lead to, seg um, to raveling. And then clay content in your gravels can reduce the, the bonding ability of the asphalt to the aggregate. Um, and that can cause raveling. And then age. Uh, as, pay, as asphalt gets old, it's going to age. Uh, it's going to oxidize, dry out, and you're going to lose some of that, that bond between the asphalt and the aggregate. And all of these types of things are important because if you've got, a, if you've got an improper compaction problem, in your mix, I'm not sure that you want to cover that mix up because now it's just going to hold water and it's never going to get out. It's, it's never going to get out. If you've got segregation type problems, then you probably need to handle the areas that are segregated differently from the rest of the pavement. Um, if you've just got a, an oxidized pavement, now is a beautiful time to do some preventive maintenance on it and, and cover it up and seal it off and, and keep it from uh, raveling. Um, too much before it gets, you know, where you need to mill it off. So what are the treatments? Well, uh, crack sealing is a very important treatment. I find that cracks in asphalt pavement will ravel just by nature because water is getting into that crack. So if you keep that crack sealed, uh, you may not keep 100% of the water out of it, but you're adding a lot more binder to keep those, those aggregates tight uh, to the face of the crack. Chip seals and low volume routes. Is, a, is an excellent way to, to fight raveling and a very inexpensive if you've got low volume uh, traffic. Microsurfacing is another great uh, way to seal the top of the pavement off if raveling is a problem. Um, thin overlays uh, or you know if it's, if it's an extensive problem you get into the mill and fill arena and, and you're, you're starting to step across the threshold from preventive maintenance to what I would consider uh, rehabilitation. Bleeding. Um, bleeding is the presence of free asphalt binder on the pavement surface. It's also called flushing. Now, there are some very, tech, very technical people that, that differentiate between bleeding and flushing and which is which. I'm going to call them both the same for today um, to make things simple. Uh, basically, I think we've all seen it. Um, the causes of it are uh, the mixed design, high asphalt content, improper air voids, or the p wrong type of AC can lead to bleeding. Uh, it's very important when you're um, doing construction plans and, and getting ready to specify uh, your, your mix for a particular route that you specify the proper binder. Um, you, can, you can very quickly cause a pavement to bleed just because you put the wrong binder in. Um, truck traffic, high truck counts uh, have, a, have a tendency to work asphalt to the surface and that's why you need to have sometimes different binders and intersections uh, because your, your intersections will, will bleed where the route won't. It's just the slow trucks and the high trucks in the certain intersections. And construction, if you allow traffic on a pavement before it's cooled sufficiently, that can cause bleeding. Two of these, as you can see, are really construction related. Um, all of it's really construction and, and specification related. But if it's long term bleeding, if it happens over um, many years, then I think it becomes the kind of, of distress that we can treat with preventive maintenance. Um, you can use spot overlays on, on what I call slow bleeders, things that, that bleed a little bit over a long time. Microsurfacing is fine over a bleeding pavement. Um, generally, you would want to mill a bleeding pavement, though, before you would overlay it with asphalt. The, the, the overlay itself possibly will have the void structure that it will allow the bleeding to continue. Debonding. Um, that's the removal of a, of a surface course, a layer or layers from the underlying layer. Uh, you literally just peel the surface off. Um, 
This would be a medium severity type of debonding. What are the causes of debonding? Um, improper compaction. Uh, in, lack of density can um, allow for higher air voids and a place for moisture to strip away the bond between the layers. That will also cause raveling. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, if it's a, um, a poor tack underneath and you have some localized areas that, are, that are, uh, don't have good density, um, chunks of pavement can come up, especially if, it, if, if you have the freeze-thaw effect. Uh, poor, tack of coat, poor tack coat and layer thickness. Layers that are too thin are more prone to uh, debonding. What are the treatments? Partial depth patching, obviously. Go in and, and just do something like a uh, pothole repair, a uh, throw and go type method. Um, that's more of a reactive type maintenance, the throw and go. Some of your more specialized mixes, hot mixes, would certainly work a lot better there. Uh, chip and seal with partial depth patching uh, can, can really help your debonding. Um, microsurfacing can stop can seal the pavement off and stop that, that debonding from happening. Or if it's, if it's uh, extensive, mill and overlay. Again, economics pay, plays a role here. If you have debonding going on every 200 feet along a, a several mile stretch, I don't think partial depth patching is the answer. You're probably too late to partial depth patch something like that. If you're, if you're starting to see it show up, then preventive maintenance comes in and, and you say, well, it's starting to, we're starting to lose that surface. It's time now to go in there with a, a chip and seal. We'll, we'll patch a couple of these uh, real quick, and we'll do a chip seal, and we'll seal that pavement off. We'll stop that moisture from getting down into that and, and, cause, and creating that debonding condition or a, or a microsurface. But if you've got a lot of it going on and you're too late, then you've got to get into more of a mill and overlay, which is, more, is really a little bit less than a, more than a preventive maintenance. You're, you're getting into the rehabilitation arena. Potholes. Potholes are bowl-shaped voids or depressions in the pavement surface. We all know what a pothole is. But I'm defining a pothole as something that is down deep in the pavement structure. Not, not a debonding situation where you're only in that top inch. But you're, you're down deep. Um, you've got a lot of like alligator type cracking around it. And probably that alligator cracking was there before the pothole. Um, potholes are uh, in, an indication that you have a structural failure in your pavement. And preventive maintenance is just not something that you're going to want to fix a pothole with. Um, what causes potholes? Moisture. Excess moisture in the subbase or the subgrade reduces the strength of the overall pavement section by reducing the support underneath it. Insufficient pavement thickness. Localized weak pavement areas bend more and crack, creating the opportunity for more water to get in. And then weather, the freezing and thawing of the pavement in the subbase and the subgrade, coupled with the heavy trucks, destroys the structure of the pavement and induces potholes. In all these three examples, we're really talking about something down deep, something structural. And preventive maintenance is not really intended to fix potholes. Um, you have potholes. You probably should have been there with some kind of a maintenance quite a long time ago. You should have been there when the first alligator cracking started in that localized area. Because if you've got alligator cracking in one localized area, small area, um, it's probably because that's a weak spot and everything around it is maybe a little bit weak and needs to be sealed off from the uh, moisture. What are the treatments for a pothole? Full depth patching of a localized area, um, minor rehabilitation or major rehabilitation. You've got to do something to fix the structure here. A thin overlay is not going to fix a pothole. Rutting. Everybody knows what rutting are, is. Vertical deformations in the pavement surface along the wheel path. Um, 
What are the causes? Improper compaction, uh, providing voids, space for further densification from traffic. As the mix densifies, rutting results. An unstable mix, a lack of stone on stone contact, allows aggregates to float in the asphalt. As traffic pushes the aggregates around, rutting is going to result, especially in your hotter weather. Hot weather lowers the strength of the, of the asphalt cement. And lack of structure. And this is the real key here. Uh, a pavement must be capable. A flexible pavement has to be capable of, of protecting the subgrade. Keeping the stresses on the subgrade down to, to a point where it can handle the load. And if there is not sufficient structure above that subgrade, then you can rut the subgrade itself. The mix is fine up above, uh, but it's the subgrade itself that's rutting. And it's important to realize when you're looking at rutting what the cause is. Because if the cause is the subgrade, then you're going to need more structure. And preventive maintenance obviously isn't something that's going to help you here. If it's the mix, then you've got to get to the root of which layer has the bad mix. If it's the surface course, um, you only need to mill the surface course out or determine if it's done rutting and put, a, put, a, put an overlay, a leveling course and a, and, a, and a micro surface on it. If it's the intermediate course and it's not done rutting and, you, and it's, you know, it's, it has the potential to get a lot deeper rut, you need to go in there and, and take out that intermediate course. And you know, you're really out getting out of preventive maintenance a little bit because it's, it's, more, it's more of an expensive fix more than anything. So you, you need to understand the cause of the rutting. ODOT has high stress guidelines which help um, people to determine where the rutting is and, and come up with the appropriate uh, solution. Corrugations. Um, corrugations are pretty typical in city streets along intersections where there's stop and go. There are a series of transverse ridges and valleys ripples, kind of like a washboard, occurring at regular intervals along the pavement. Very similar to rutting in a lot of ways. The causes are an unstable mix or a weak subgrade possibly, forced stop control and high truck counts. Um, trucks stopping and starting are going to cause that. Actual gears, uh, shifting of gears can cause it more than anything. Um, what are the treatments? Basically, mill and fill. Find out where, again, just like rutting, find out where the mix, the weak mix is. It's generally in the surface course for corrugation. It's not a deep-seated problem. Um, the rut, if, if it's a deep-seated problem, you're going to see it in the form of rutting. Uh, corrugations are generally um, in the surface course, and, and, a, and a mill and fill or a a stiff, uh, possibly a stiff um, uh, microsurfacing can, uh, can take care of the corrugations. Wheel track cracking. Uh, this is a high severity photo of wheel track cracking. Um, intermittent, single, multiple longitudinal cracks located within three feet, within a three feet wide wheel track. Um, also called alligator cracking. Uh, but alligator cracking is really the extensive wheel track cracking. You can have a single crack um, wheel track cracking. And this is a structural failure, wheel track cracking. This is a problem with, with, with your, your structural support. Uh, pavement sections which are not designed for the loading are going to create, or you're going to see wheel track cracking. Um, Generally, you're going to need high truck, well, you're going to need some trucks to load the pavement. You've got to be careful when you're looking at wheel track cracking because if you see it, if you see cracks in the wheel track, but you see cracks everywhere else, then maybe it's block and transverse cracking and just a, a thermal aging type of cracking. So you've got to look at it carefully and you say, is this cracking only in the wheel track? And when you see it only in the wheel track, 
you know then that you've got some structural concerns. And a lot of times, this, this type of wheel track cracking will have rutting associated with it. Because what we really have is a structural deficiency. And that rutting would be in the subgrade. You're, you're flexing the subgrade to get the wheel track cracking phenomenon. So you're, you're, you're getting out of the realm of preventive maintenance. You're going to need something structural. Uh, you should be looking at some deflection testing to find out how weak your pavement is and whether or not you, you need to uh, put a thicker overlay on or just a couple inches will do. Uh, easel counts, truck counts are very important. You need to provide better drainage here where you've got a structural problem. Um, I can't tell you how important it is to put in aggregate drains or, or pipe under drains or something like that in a case like this. Because just reducing the moisture content in that subgrade is going to stiffen that subgrade up and going to help your, your structure. Preventive maintenance is not recommended for, for wheel track cracking. And this is the other type of cracking. Here you can see the wheel track cracking here, but it's not rutted. There's no rutting associated with it. And you've got the interconnecting cracks, which divide the pavement into rectangular blocks all over the pavement. So this is a case where even though there's wheel track cracking, you really don't have a structural problem. What you have is an old, uh, probably 12, 13-year-old asphalt surface that's just getting old and drying out. And it's time for something to, uh, to be done to it. What are the causes of block and transverse cracking? Thermal movement. You know, we, we got to realize here that asphalt is really a lot like concrete. The glue's different, but they're both made up of the same aggregates. An aggregate is what has a thermal coefficient of expansion. So asphalt wants to crack just like concrete does. Uh, I'm sure all of you have driven over a, an asphalt pavement and thought it would, had a rigid base under it, but it didn't, simply because it has thermal cracking. And with time, asphalt cement ages, and it loses its elasticity and becomes more brittle, causing even more cracking to take place. So block and transverse cracking is really a very typical um, thing of an asphalt pavement that's performing the way that it should. It, it's, uh, it's, just, it's just the animal that we have to understand. What do you do? You crack seal it to keep those cracks from letting a lot of moisture in. And this is early. Uh, you looked at, wrong way. You looked at this picture. Um, this is high severity block and transverse cracking. Uh, you've got a lot of cracking there. I don't think anybody would want to crack seal something like this. But in the early stages of block and transverse cracking, um, where your crack spacing is 8 to 10 feet or more, um, longitudinally and 10 feet uh, transversely, you can very easily crack seal something like that. Keep the, keep the moisture out so that you don't lose your mix. And then later you would come in with more preventive maintenance and possibly look to some of the other type of treatments that you can do, such as chip seals uh, or thin overlays. Um, notice I don't throw microsurfacing in on this one. Um, if it's if there's a lot of cracking, uh, you might not want to do a chips, uh, a micro. There is a new product out there I'm sure that we're going to hear about today of more of a, a flexible microsurfacing, which might work better for a, 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 a lot of cracking. But in general, um, they may disagree with me later today. But in general, um, your, your, your chip seal is a much better remedy for a lot of cracking on a uh, flexible treatment. If you've got higher traffic, then you need to get out there earlier in the early stages if you want to do a micro. Certainly don't wait until there's a lot of cracking. Get it early. Longitudinal cracking, um, deterioration of the longitudinal joint formed during construction. Um, in a lot of cases, we see um, in the center of the, of the pavement, we see this, this uh, crack here. That a lot of times is due to a, a segregation type of a phenomenon. If you watch a paving machine go down the road, that's generally where his gearbox is on his auger. And his gearbox will tend to push the larger aggregates out of the way. 
and create a slight, uh, almost a fissure there that you can't really see until the pavement's quite a bit older. And sometimes you'll get the cracking like that. But in general, you're always going to get this, this, this joint crack right here where the, um, um, the two seams are melded together. Um, it, basically, it's a construction joint or a cold joint. Uh, you're going to get poorer compaction at that construction joint. Um, that's going to allow more water to get in. It's going to exacerbate uh, the crack. It's going to make it open up earlier. Uh, and then widening joints where you've widened the pavement um, underneath, uh, you're going to see reflective cracking there. Um, it's always going to probably come up. What do you do to these type of longitudinal cracks? Crack seal early. Early crack sealing is the best thing you can do. Um, can't say enough to crack seal flexible pavements. Get them early before you're, you're doing a whole lot. And we found that fabric membranes along longitudinal cracks prior to overlays can be effective. Um, we found that uh, in longitudinal cracks and joints only, however. Edge cracking. Edge cracks are longitudinal or crescent-shaped cracks, usually within one foot of the pavement edge line. This is a high severity photograph. You can see it all along here. Um, you're losing support along the edge. You don't have a shoulder there that's, that's meaningful. Um, lack of edge support is the most common on the two lane systems where there's no shoulders. Narrow lanes, 10 foot lanes where trucks are um, pushing that outside shoulder to stay uh, within the center line. That's going to induce the, the edge cracking. What are the treatments? Well, preventive maintenance is not really a treatment for edge cracking. Edge cracking is a structural problem. You need to go in there and rebuild that pavement. You need to put in some drainage when you do that. And you need to give yourself a little bit of a shoulder. Um, that's really the only solution to edge cracking. If you've got a lot of edge cracking on a route, it's not a good preventive maintenance candidate. It's more of a structural problem. And that's it. Um, in the back, I've got some handouts. Um, ODOT has put together a preventive maintenance guideline. I have a copy back there for everybody that uh, shows how we do preventive maintenance. We've got actual um, a pavement management system that, that can run our, our preventive maintenance um, program. We can query into our pavement management system and come up with available candidates for preventive maintenance. And the logic to all of that is in that um, guidelines back there, how we did it. Um, all of the treatments that are available and specifications, the, the spec numbers, the specs themselves are not in that handout, but the, the specifications that are useful for preventive maintenance are in there. And you can uh, get on our website and find that, uh, those specifications that, that you want to look at. Um, I've also got a single sheet handout back there on pavement cracking that kind of goes into more detail of why concrete pavements crack and you know, what a good crack is and what a bad crack is. And you're welcome to all of that. Um, and other than that, uh, I'd be more than happy to take any questions or uh, let the next fellow do his presentation. Yeah. Well, you know, I've heard that question a thousand times, and, 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 and I can't give you a definitive answer. I can give you my opinion. I think that, that we, we've been consistently trying to solve different problems with our asphalt mixes. You know, back in the 80s and all, we had rich mixes that didn't oxidize. They, they, they Kept, had a lot of goo in them. Uh, occasionally, you'd see a little bit of rutting because they had a lot of goo, but they didn't oxidize. And ODOT, I think, was, was a very, very strong player in that. We said, we're starting to get rutting. These mixes are so rich, we're getting some rutting. And so we dried the mixes up. And we did that on purpose. Uh, we didn't have any rutting problems. <laughs> of course, the mixes were drier. 
and we, we uh, had some of the raveling problems instead. And so now we've, we've gone to the next step. We've said, OK, we don't want the rich mixes that are full of rutting. We don't want the dry mixes that are, that are raveling out. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a binder in there that's, that's a little more resistant to raveling. And, we're gonna, and it'll richen the mix up without creating the rutting. So I think we're probably better off today than we were years ago. But we're more complicated today than we were years ago. And that's why we have to be very careful when we specify asphalt mixes. Because there's a lot more that we can do with a mix today. And a lot of mixes are, are, are definitely set up with a certain kind of a asphalt grade that, that's, that's perfect for heavy truck traffic. Um, but it may not be perfect for stop and go intersections. So we've, we've got to be more careful when we specify our mixes. Obviously, you want to talk with your local um, flexible pavements organization, with your um, Asphalt Institute representatives. Because I think what we've got today is better, than, but it is more complicated. And you've got, to, you've got to be specifying the right mix, the right juice, for the application that you have to keep you out of trouble. It's not as simple as it was years ago. So that's, that's kind of my philosophy on the whole thing. There was one other person who had a question. Yeah? Whether it's more economical, you're looking at talking about life cycle and economics. Yeah. Is that your question? Um, that's that's probably been the most debated question ever. Which is more economical? I think they're very close. Personally, um, done. I've done tons and tons of life cycle costs, and I see the economics of both. Um, and it's not an easy decision ever. Um, it's a very difficult decision. It depends on, you know, in a lot of cases, it, it, it should depend on the amount of traffic that you have. Um, it should depend upon what kind of, of traffic level that you have, whether you have a high volume of trucks, um, whether or not you have stop and go. There's a, there's a whole lot of things that you need to look at. And, and that's true with both industries. There's there's a million ways that either product can go bad. And there's, there's good examples of great performance in both products. And to be honest with you, I think more of it needs, more time needs to be spent in the construction side of things, no matter which product you choose. Um, and you'll have a lot more success and a lot more economical pavement if you build them right to begin with. And I'm not up here trying to badmouth construction at all. Don't, don't get me wrong. But I can see where problems can, can arise. And we've got to build them right to begin with before we really know what the true uh, cost of the product, how low the cost of the product can be. Any more? Yeah? Can a pavement be too old for chip No, I don't think so. I, I think it can be too distressed for chip and seal. Um, but I don't think it can be too old. Uh, there's a lot of good pavements out there that are very old. But they've been maintained over time well. And uh, chip and seal is a fine application. As long as you don't have the, the, pro the, the problematic distresses that show structural failure. Uh, chip and seal. And you don't, you know, you've got to be careful of your traffic level and things like that. But there's new, new chip. Our new specification for chip and seal is using polymerized binders. Uh, Chip and seals today can be much more forgiving than the chip and seals of 10 years ago, as far as traffic is concerned. Yeah? Have you had any problems with that in terms of uh, really way to do a favor? I know I've had a couple of cases where there's, once they laid the concrete in between the transverse joints, Be removed, or is it 
will it create problems in the future if you wait until you get there? Is this something that's happening during construction that you're seeing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a curing problem. So they're either working the mix too much or they maybe their mix design is, is too high on paste, not enough stone in it. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of reasons that they can create that, but that's, that's, in my experience, that's generally not led to a great deal of deterioration over time. If it's just very surface and it's not widespread. Um, but I'd be careful of it. I'd certainly try to get the contractor to straighten his, his operation out so that it, is, it shouldn't be there. It should not be there. It seems seem really odd that within, within you know, a few weeks, well, a couple, about a week or a week yeah. and a half after the concrete was laid, these cracks were occurring. They're working their mix too much, I would say. Is it recommended for them to remove it? Or? I'd, I'd, I'd have to look at something like that on a case-by-case -case basis, to be honest with you. I would certainly be looking at it with a raised eyebrow. Shouldn't be there. Any other questions? Yeah. You talked about preventative maintenance. Uh, we've got roads that were built, of course, way back in the day. We're not designed whatsoever to handle the kind of loads that they're getting today, uh, whether it be for weight or width or both. Yep. Are load limits enforceable? If you've got a road that you know what is causing the problem, namely semis, due to a facility going in, and you know it's basically just destroying the road because mm -hmm. the base was never there. Right. And uh, you know it's just, just turned into a situation where the road is it's continuously rutting, uh, pushing out on the edges, just like you say your edge cracks, and it's all due to high weight. Traffic semis. Yep. Like I say, preventative maintenance is our load limits enforceable on country roads, back roads. Well, you'd, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not really um, smart enough to answer that question. Well, I understand you're not law enforcement. Right. But I don't know if you did. I know the state of Ohio can enforce load limits if it's illegally loaded. We can pull them over and 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 give them a ticket and not let them leave until they lighten the load. Um, load limits on a, on, a, on a county road or something, township, township road, uh, whether or not you can post load limits. I know they do it on bridges all the time. Whether or not you can do that on a, on a township road, I don't know. Um, I think a lot of that goes back to you know, the, 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 the time when facilities are allowed to be built in those areas and the zoning and everything else like that. Um, when you're building a big facility, that somebody needs to pay attention to the roads that are going to be used by the facility and whether or not they're up to snuff. And if not, maybe that needs to be included in the building uh, zoning uh, permits. But um, no, I think what you really need to do is you need to rebuild that road because that's commerce, that's our economy, that's our tax base, and uh, somehow somebody's got to get the cash together to, to put in a, a road that can handle the, the load. I think that's the best solution. Not always the easiest one, though. Any others? Okay, well, thanks for your attention. Uh, if you guys think of any more questions, I'll be here till at least after lunch. Feel free to grab me then. Thank you, Harry. your handouts handed out or do you want to just leave them? They can, they, they can pick them up as, okay. they, as they see fit. Eric has handouts. What we generally do is rather than uh, give everybody a handout, uh, they're on the table.